Well, good evening, everyone. Uh, welcome to the Hoover Institution. My name is Samuel Tadros. I'm a distinguished visiting fellow here at the Hoover Institution. And uh, I'll be moderating today's discussion. The Hoover Institution is an organization that's dedicated to seeking to improve the human condition by advancing ideas that promote economic prosperity and opportunity for everyone while securing the peace of the United States and the world. The two ideas that are deeply linked with its distinguished scholars, renowned Hoover Library, and the distinction of counting two former secretaries of state and the current Secretary of Defense, one might add, among its scholars, the Hoover Institution through the DC office tries or aims to bring to the DC policy to community the work and important contributions of its scholars. Today, we will be discussing False Dawn, Protest, Democracy, and Violence in the New Middle East, Stephen Cook's important new book. Nearly seven years ago, an act of desperation by Tunisian street vendor became a wave of change that swept the Arabic-speaking world as the fire he lit moved from capital to capital, bringing down the rule of several Arab strongmen. The winds of change were blowing in a moment few in the region or in the outside world had imagined. But if squares across the Middle East were occupied by enthusiastic young men dreaming of change, the ripple of hope could be felt thousands of miles away in Washington and across the world. Journalists, academics, scholars, and policy makers, nearly all were caught in the frenzy of excitement. The Arab exception to the third wave of democracy was finally collapsing under the weight of millions of young Arabs yearning for freedom. Today, freedom and democracy are hardly the words, the words that come to mind as we follow the developments in the region. Horror, as one follows the civil war in Syria. Chaos, as one thinks of Libya. Sectarian wars, as one looks at the Gulf and the Levant. Authoritarianism in Egypt. And pure savagery, as one follows the trail of blood of the Islamic State. The great sandstorm that has hit the lands of the Arabs has not ended yet. We are still in its midst. Many a state may yet be covered by the sand. Many a state may yet to be unearthed. But it is important and indeed necessary for us to take a moment in the midst of all of this and think back and reflect on what has been going on in the region, what has gone wrong, and what can be learned from that experience. We are fortunate for Stephen Cook bringing his superb knowledge of the region's history together with his understanding of the power structures and dynamics of its present, tying them together in a tale to tell the story of promise and failure of the Middle East uprising. But False Dawn is not solely a book about the Middle East. Throughout the story, we encounter Washington. We encounter the policy community the flawed analysis, the policy battles, and the general naivete about the region. Stephen Cook is the Eni Enrico Matai. I pronounced it it's right. It's good enough. It's good enough. <laughs> Senior fellow. Your Arabic's better than your Italian. <laughs> <laughs> Senior fellow for Middle East and African studies at the Council on Foreign Relations. He's an expert on Arab and Turkish politics, as well as US Middle East policy. Cook is the author of two important books that I've benefited from a lot that I've taught at certain moments in my courses, The Struggle for Egypt from Nasser to Tahrir Square, and his earlier work, Ruling but Not Governing, the Military and Political Development in Egypt, Algeria, and Turkey. His articles have been widely published in newspapers and magazines, and his blog remains a must read for anyone interested in Middle Eastern politics in Washington. As a matter of logistics, Stephen Cook will be saying a few words about his book, after which I will be discussing the book themes with him. Until 6.15, I will then open the floor for questions by the audience. Please join me in welcoming Stephen Cook for our conversation of his excellent new book. 
Thank you, uh, thank you, Sam, so much for that uh, extraordinarily generous introduction, and thank you all for for coming here, despite the fact that no one wants to sit in the front row. It is a, a brutally hot evening here in Washington, and so uh, I doubly thank you for braving uh, braving the humidity and, and coming out to to share, uh, uh, so I can share with you uh, some thoughts about about the book. Um, and Sam asked me to give you just a kind of brief presentation. Uh, and, and what I thought I would do, and I'm glad you mentioned ruling but not governing and the struggle for Egypt, because I really see those two books as a precursor to False Dawn. Um, that th that's sort of a triplet. I, I actually don't know what the fourth book is going to be, because I'm, I'm, I'm sort of said everything I had to say. Maybe I'll retire now. But it, they really do grow out of each other. In, in ruling but not governing, I was exploring the kind of historical, political development of these countries through uh, the roles of militaries and, and trying to understand why there was what we at the time, and I think probably holds true, why regimes remained stable despite enormous, enormous challenges. And then from that came the struggle for Egypt because in writing that book, which was about Egypt, Turkey, and Algeria, when you're writing about the military in Turkey, it's kind of a layup. I mean, it's pretty, the, the, the story kind of writes itself. When you write about the military in Algeria, it's also kind of a layup. But Egypt is the much more complicated, uh, the much more complicated case, the case that I spent the most time on. The, time, the place I spent the most time was in Egypt in, in trying to write that book, which started out as my dissertation. And so from ruling but not governing came my exploration of Egyptian politics and history and the struggle for Egypt. And just as a, a personal aside, I handed in the first draft of the struggle for Egypt, which wasn't even called the struggle for Egypt at the time. It was called something like Drift Along the Nile, like Nagib Mahfouz's uh, book. And uh, on January 20th, 2011, January 20th, got on the plane two days later and went to, and went to Egypt. And then three days after that, found myself in, in, in Tahrir Square. And of course, since I work in Washington, it's always about me. Um, I said, wow, this could actually be pretty good for this book that I, that I just handed in. Um, and, I will, and this is where I get into False Dawn. It was an extraordinary moment. I was not in Tahrir Square during the full 18 days. I was there for the first four of them. Uh, my wife told me I had to come home. Um, but it was still, even in that short period, it was an extraordinary moment. Uh, to watch uh, and to be an observer. And it's, I cop, and I think I do it in the book, I, I cop to the romance of the barricades. It was quite extraordinary. But there was that moment in Tahrir Square. And then 11 months later, I went back to Egypt. And, and, and after Mubarak fell, I was going back to Egypt every six or seven weeks. It's no wonder I don't remember my daughter, my younger daughter's second year of life. And um, I was, and one of these trips was December 2011. And there was another large protest in mid-December 2011. And it was the Battle of the People's Assembly, the Battle of the Cabinet Building, whatever you want to call it. It was just south of the square. And it was totally different from that extraordinary, edifying, romantic moment in Tahrir Square. And things had been bumpy and difficult. And I had written a piece the summer before saying, well, you know, this kind of thing is to be expected. This is a transition and a transformation of societies and so on. And at that moment where I saw young Egyptians, just like young Egyptians that I encountered in Tahrir Square 11 months earlier, squaring off against the military police and, and the police and the essential security forces, there was no real principle. It was like gang warfare. It was, it was the ultras, the soccer fanatics, giving payback. And then payback being repaid. And I couldn't figure out what this was about. And instead of the, you know, we're all, hold up your head, we're all Egyptians, and, and bread, freedom, and social justice, I heard death to the field marshal. And that was the very kernel of this. And while this was going on, you had Libya that was already had deteriorated into, 
into violence. And I, and I, I think about Libya, and I think about everybody remembers on February 20th, 2011. Now, there's a lot of young people here, so maybe you guys were in like sixth grade. But I remember, <laughs> Sam mem remembers, some of the other folks here remember. On February 20th, 2011, Saif al Islam Qaddafi got on television. And everybody remembers the quote, we'll fight to every last man, woman, and bullet. And of course, this was rather extraordinary because Saif was the, you know, he was the reformer. He, he had his PhD from the London School of Economics, and he was well-trained. Plagiarized, Pla it turned out. Plagi at least he didn't pay for it, someone else to do it. He plagiarized it, at least. Um, he was well-versed in the consultant speak that the Harvard Business School's faculty had drummed into him. And, and here he was, was threatening violence. And, and everybody remembers that. But there was something else that he said that I thought was extraordinarily prescient. And he said, Libyans, we need to settle our differences. Because we're not Egyptians and we're not Tunisians. We will fight for the next 40 years. And to me, it spoke to this kind of culture of violence that his father and the then this, this ruse, this, this people's jamharia had, had created. Uh, at the same time, um, what was happening here in Washington, the foreign policy establishment, which I guess we are part of, uh, was in the thrall with the idea that Turkey could be a model for the Arab world, and that Turkey was uniquely positioned that the United States in concert with Turkey could help with soft landings in the region and help democratic transformations and be an engine of economic growth. But as everybody in Washington was talking about the Turkish model, although I will not cop to that. I always thought the Turkish model thing was, an, was a silly idea. But the authoritarianism of Erdogan's Turkey was deepening. And then, of course, you have Tunisia, which I won't spend as much time of it in this opening remark. Tunisia, which quickly became the one Arab Spring success story. I mean, how many times did you read that? And have you read that? And do you continue to read that? First of all, let me just point out the extraordinarily low bar to be the one Arab Spring success story. <clears throat> and then secondly, talking about Tunisia as the one Arab Spring success story struck me as a political thing to say, not an accurate thing to say. That, Things had started going sideways and actually bad in some of these other places. And that Washington, the West more generally, was invested in the idea that 2000, late 2010, 2011, and 2012 in the Middle East was 1989, 1990, 1991 in Eastern and Central Europe. And so that it needed to have a success. And so we started talking about it when actually Tunisia is much, much more interesting. Yeah. Of course, we, want, we would like for it to, see, to be a success, but it was neither a success nor a failure. And calling it a success makes it difficult to have a good policy because you have to have good assumptions about the world to have a good policy. This was the kernel of this book. People weren't seeing the world for actually as it was. It was what they wanted it to be. And this was, and I spent a, a large amount of time in, in the first couple of chapters, exploring this idea of the difference between the world as it was and the world in which we, we, we want it to be. And so the book's about why it didn't end up the way we talked about so much. And we, I mean, the royal way, and I include myself. I had some bad calls as well. Uh, and my explanation for how all of this failed, and we can talk a little more, but to just give you a taste of it, at first I focus in on this idea of revolution. And it, it, it's easy to talk about a revolution. It seems like that's what happened. But actually, what happened were not revolutions in the region. There was no overthrow of the prevailing political and social institutions that reinforce each other. And so it made it easy for counter-revolutionary forces to undermine those people who really did want to live in more democratic and open societies. And that. Um, because of this, everything in these countries became contested. And as things became failure, violent, be, as, as people confronted failure of everything, it seemed, to, at, from their perspective, 
violence became an option for some of them. And in the breach of this failure of the Arab republics, in the breach of the failure of the Arab uprisings, in the failure of the Muslim Brotherhood's experiment in governance, another message that was appealing emerged. It had been there all along, but was particularly appealing at that moment, and that was the appeal of the extremist message embodied in Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi, who may or may not be dead for the fifth time in any event. At least. At least. <laughs> at least. And then as Sam, as Sam pointed out, I touched on a little bit, and I'll close here, on you know, the, the American component here. What we were thinking, what we were saying, what our expectations were. And, and part of my radical project for this book was to suggest to people here in Washington and people outside of the Beltway that even though we sit around a conference room table in Washington and say there's a problem in some part of the world, what should we do that there isn't always an American solution to the problem? And if you look at the existential struggles going on within Arab countries, the traditional tools of American diplomacy are particularly irrelevant to those, to those struggles. And that's a difficult thing, I think, for people in, in, in Washington, D.C. To, to accept. Well, it puts it out, out of a job, basically. Well, I didn't want to, I didn't want to go that if far. We, if, we're, if we don't have anything to suggest. Yeah, I, I, think that that, I think that that's quite right, is that if we are not you know, promoting change, if we are not putting out these fires, there are people who have less to do in, in their jobs. But I think that to the extent that Egyptians, for example, define their domestic struggles in existential terms about, and I remember this, and, and I'm sure Sam you do as well, that at the time of the military intervention, or coup, or second revolution, whatever, I, just using the terminology that Egyptians use, people talked about, and it, liberals, or so-called liberals, people who had supported the uprising against Mubarak, had said, well, we have no choice because we're battling for the heart and soul of our, of our country, you know, in supporting the military, to me, that was a tip off of, the, of the, the extraordinarily high stakes in which people viewed their struggles. And that, regardless of what an American Secretary of State or an American President said or did, people in Egypt were going to pursue their interests and their politics, politics as they calculated them. And that this was really an Egyptian story. And then, you know, kind of think about that in terms of other, other countries where there are, are similar high stakes struggles going on about essentially identity. I think I've gone on too long, Keith. Well, we can start from the, when people think of the turmoil that has been going on in the region, or even think of the region, um, there are six countries usually identified as having uh, suffered or benefited from the Arab Spring. Uh, Tunisia, um, Libya, Egypt, Syria, Yemen, and Bahrain. Only three of these, the North African countries, we encounter in the book. Now, I can fully sympathize with excluding Syria. I mean, why on earth would anyone want to write about the complexity of what's going on there? But why the choice of these three countries and ignoring or, or not giving attention to a place like Yemen and Bahrain or others where the, the Arab Spring um, had a change or an impact, Morocco, where mm -hmm. the framework changes, although it doesn't witness the same level of revolution as the others? It, it, it's a great question, and, and I've confronted it before, and I confronted it when I was writing the book. You know, what, what mix of countries? And as you know, I'm a political scientist, and so I can come up with all kinds of fancy explanations for it, but I won't. What I'll say is this. One, I didn't want to touch Syria. First of all, there's going to be just you all wait. There's going to be, you're going to be loaded down with Syria books. Uh, it, and they're all in the pipeline. And it, it just seemed to me that it didn't fit and it would eat the rest of the, the rest of my cases. Bahrain and Yemen, you know, you write books to learn about things. I, I never, I didn't understand Egypt until I wrote The Struggle for Egypt. I, I mean, I thought that I did. I knew a lot about it, but I didn't think I understood. And there's plenty of things about Egypt that I still don't, don't understand. But I was drawn to the North African cases because it struck me this is where 
this began, this is where the stakes are in ways extraordinary. I mean, Egypt, mm -hmm. country, I, I think the population, 93 million people the other day. Libya's proximity to Europe. Tunisia, as the, couldn't write a book about the aftermath of the Arab uprisings without including Tunisia. And that left Yemen, a country which, I've been to every country in the region except for Yemen and Algeria. And it was Algeria where I, I didn't go because they denied my visa because I'm apparently not worthy or a danger or something. Um, or and because you're Jewish. Or, or that. Yeah, more um, likely. <laughs> but I, I needed to start from a place where I knew yeah. something. And it, to me, there's a nice symmetry of the three Arab cases and actually the Turkish case. First, the inclusion of Turkey. And this is something that... And that's my second Your second question, question right. I mean, I, I'm anticipating. Turkey jumps there. Right. Um, we don't think usually of these changes in Turkey, the Gezi protests or anything, as part of the same story as right. there. And to me... But then you add Turkey. It's To me, it was organically connected. And in fact, when, when the book was uh, in a proposal stage, was under review... It was funny. Some reviewers said, why Turkey? And some reviewers said, Turkey, that's great. You got to include Turkey. And to me, and so, to me, first, you have the three North African cases and then add Turkey. And at a basic level, you have four countries and four different outcomes. You have Libya fragmentation. You have Egypt resurgent authoritarianism. You have Turkey, kind of a case study in the reversal of liberalism or liberalizing reforms, not liberalism. Okay. And then in Tunisia, you have neither success nor failure. That seemed to me, that was an interesting mix of outcomes that was worthy of exploring and that we can tease out some lessons. Now, onto this Turkey question. We can explore the other things in more depth because Turkey, I didn't just write about Turkey because I know a lot about Turkey. To me, again, I'm, I'm gonna guess that I've sucked more tear gas than anybody else in this room because I was also in the Gezi Park protests. And being in those protests, I heard a lot of the same things that I heard in Egypt about police brutality, about the arrogance of power, about the depredations of crony capitalism, about the lack of democratic institutions through which people can process their grievances, the anger and the, and the, the, the feeling that there was no one to represent for these people. And it was interesting, I remember Bulent Arinch at the time, the deputy prime minister, call these people marginals. And my answer in a, in a piece that I wrote not long thereafter was not that they were marginals, but that they had been marginalized by the Justice and Development Party. And to me, there was a direct connection between the girl in the red dress in Gezi Park and the girl in the blue bra. The girl, for those of you who don't follow this as well as I do, the girl in the blue bra was this young Egyptian woman who's covered, who was beaten mercilessly the day after the Battle of the People's Assembly, or two days after the Battle of the People's Assembly began, I think it was December 17th or December 18th, 2011. I mean, just mercilessly. And when she fell to the ground, her undergarments were revealed and she was wearing, no one knows, I mean, at the time, no one knew who she was. And she was referred to as the girls, but and it was an uproar around it. And there's, to my mind, these, the images are just seared into my head. In Gezi Park, a young woman in a red dress who is as far away from me as Sam is, in which Turkish riot police who are known for their brutality takes this, it, it, this thing of pepper spray, a large like bottle of pepper spray, and just pepper sprays her. And she is helplessly being, and these two things, and in a kind of iconic symbolic way, it, these things are connected in my mind. And that, so you have the similar types of grievances. You have this Turkish model kind of mania in, in Washington. I remember NPR, I talk about this in the book, NPR did this mashup of everybody's talk, everybody who they interviewed talking about Turkey as a model uh, in, in the region. And then finally, even though you did not have the overthrow of Recep Tayyip Erdogan as a result of the Gezi Park protests. Some of the dynamics, the way in which the institutions of the state were manipulated, bent, leveraged in order to undermine opposition was very similar in 
Egypt. That, and, and, and what I see when I come to at the end of the book is a certain amount of continuity of all, in all of these cases. And that here you have Erdogan, who came to power vowing to undermine the Turkish national security state and vowing to undermine Kemalism using the very same methods and institutions to undermine his opponents as the Kemalists did to him. And you have continuity in Egypt represented by Abdel Fattah Sisi. And even in Libya, there's a certain amount of, I mean, I'm not even talking about the picture of Khalifa Heftar that emerged last week in which he looks like he's wearing the same uniform as Muammar Gaddafi. I'm talking about the kind of institutional continuity, but not formal institutions of the Jamharia, but the informal institutions that really ruled in, in, in Libya. And of course, Tunisia, the one Arab Spring success story, you have the soft restoration of an old order. So to me, there was a lot of continuity. And, and maybe I'm just weird, but I saw Turkey as being really part uh, of this. As an aside, my, um, my research associate, who I mentioned to you earlier, is a brilliant young Egyptian guy, was so happy that I included Turkey so it wouldn't just be an Arab story. His like, Arab nationalism was coming out. He didn't want it just to be. <laughs> Well, if, if you would include the non-Arab story, a lot of people have drawn the, the link between the Green Revolution in Iran 2009, the protests there, and what happened in these Arab countries um, later on. Iran is not present in the book, um, Come neither as, a, as a, um, what happened during the Green Revolution or as part of the, the larger battle for the future. Um, do you think the dynamics in the Iranian case were quite different from the ones? I do. I, I struggled with this a little bit. Iran does come up, but only to criticize the Obama administration. I, you know, I'm, I'm, at times I'm friendly to it, at times I'm not friendly to it. And the Green Revolution part, I'm, I'm, I'm not really all that friendly to it. And I, I've thought about this. It's, a, it's an interesting question, especially since... Partisans of the invasion of Iraq wanted to make the connection between the war in Iraq and the uprisings around the Iraq. And I found no evidence of that. I, you know, no evidence whatsoever. And I did kind of root around looking for some connection between Iran. And it seemed to me that the, the time differences between the two, and that other than that moment, and correct me if I'm wrong, I mean, you would know this better than I would, but other than that immediate aftermath of the Iranian Revolution in the, in the late 1970s, and that kind of that energized Islamists in the Arab world, that Iran only at very specific moments had an impact on the way in which Arabs, particularly young Arabs, view the world. And those specific moments were things like, you know, I remember arriving in Cairo in September 2006 and being stunned at the photos of then Iranian President uh, Ahmadinejad and, 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 and Hassan Nasrallah. And this was coming on the heels of the, of the war between, uh, between Israel and Hezbollah. And of course, the Egyptians were on the Israeli side. So this was kind of a, so to me, that was not so much about Iran, but it was about opposition to Hosni Mubarak. One, one other thing that in the research for the book, I remember talking to actually a, a, a young Jordanian activist and saying, and this is, this is both Iran and about Turkey, saying, you know, what, what is it that Saudi Arabia has to offer us? What does Iran have to offer us? But look at Turkey. It's a prosperous democratic place. Now, when she was talking to me, it was less democratic than, but there was, there, there was an imagination, there was an imagine that gave some credence to that Turkish model argument, but Iran didn't seem to me to register yeah. so. Yeah. So the Turkey model, you obviously discussed that fascination in Washington um, with the idea of Turkey becoming a model, even before the Arab Spring sure. began. Turkey as a link between East and West, between Islam and Christianity, all of that argument. The Turkish government itself, in a sense, bought that idea or presented that idea. I was stunned. While uh, denying it at the I, same time. I, I was stunned during a meeting with uh, a leader in the, the AKP party 
when he was talking about uh, Syria, he said, we were once the same country. And the words were striking for me. You weren't actually the same country. You were occupying Syria as the Ottoman Empire. That's very different from saying you're the same country. But that mindset uh, drove Erdogan's policy. And at the moment, it seemed quite successful. I mean, uh, 2000, uh, spring of 2013, if Erdogan was looking at the region, Egypt, the Brotherhood, Libya, um, Indonesia, and Nahda was in power, things looked like the bet was working. Today, the bet is not working at all. Everywhere, the Turks are confronting problems in their immediate border area. Um, US is working with YPG, the, the independence referendum among the Kurds. What's the thinking now in Turkey? How does Turkey today, when Erdogan looks at the region, thinks of his country's role? Well, there's a lot there. And let me just start out by saying two things. Keep in mind that when you are President Recep Tayyip Erdogan of Turkey, when you win, you win. And when you lose, you also, you also tend to win. But let me back up before I talk about what, what the thinking is. When someone from the Justice and Development Party, the AKP, would say, after all, we're the same country, there is a particular view of the Ottoman period among the AKP leadership. That there's a valorization of the Ottoman period um, that it was this period of, of progress and that the Ottomans were kind of benevolent around the region because after all, we're all Muslims. There is a, there's a strong sense of Muslim solidarity in the justice and development world. You know, and, and you see it in places. Uh, the justice, just as an aside, I mean, they get, AKP and Erdogan get a lot of criticism for a lot of things in Washington, deservedly so. But if you look at the Syrian refugee problem, I think without this kind of sense of, in Arabic, asabiya, these, these refugees from Syria would be in, in terrible, terrible conditions in Turkey. Now, it's not easy to host three plus million people. And the Turks have generally been good at it. When no one would dare go to Somalia, Turkey's development agency, the Turkish version of USAID, was there out of this kind of Muslim salary. So they deserve, so in, in one sense, this kind of Ottomist, Ottomanist view, this imagined Ottoman empire has served them and, 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 and countries okay, pretty well. But the reason why they can believe this is not only it's great politics, they're also cut off from their own history because of Ataturk's reform. So they don't understand it. And Erdogan kind of has built a mystique on a number of things, you know, hitting the Israelis and saying things about the Israelis in ways that, you know, Hosni Mubarak, when he was in power, would never have dared to. And this kind of electrified people in, in, in the Arab world. And then he was, and it, I think in Washington, the, and, and for a long time, the AKP was saying that they have particular insights in the Arab world because of the cultural affinities in their history. And so then when Erdogan came out very early on and said, Mubarak should listen to his people and leave, people said, wow. But of course, Erdogan and Mubarak always had difficult relations. So it was pretty easy for Erdogan to say Mubarak should leave. They didn't like each other. And, and, and Mubarak did a lot to try to keep Erdogan out of, the, out of the region. And of course, when you look at what the Turks were really up to, they were thick as thieves with Bashar al-Assad. Billions of dollars were at stake in Qaddafi's Libya. And the Turks, maybe, you know, in retrospect, this looked like a good thing, but they were not on board with the intervention. Uh, in the intervention in Libya, but they were quickly able to kind of transform that into a leadership role, in part because here in the United States, to some extent in Europe, we were thinking about Turkey as a, as a leader in the region. I remember, I'm not sure if you were there, but in Cairo in September 2011, he came. Erdogan came on this triumphant visit throughout North Africa and was welcomed, was welcomed everywhere. Um, but I, I think that there were two turning points for, for Turkey in the region. One was those Gezi Park protests May, that began late May 2013, lasted throughout June, continued through most of the summer, in which Erdogan used tactics that were similar to recently deposed Arab dictators. 
And that whole idea in the Arab world that Turkey had something to offer them went away. And then you had the coup in Egypt, in which Erdogan, for I think both on principle and because of his own domestic politics and his own fears, was strongly and vocally opposed to Abdel Fattah Sisi, welcomed the Brotherhood to Cairo, gave them a platform to delegitimize uh, the new regime in Egypt. And this made the Saudis, the Emiratis, the Israelis, and others very, very unhappy uh, with Turkey. And of course, he had bad relations with Baghdad already, and he had bad relations with Damascus. So their strategic position cratered. Now to your question, this is a really long answer. They have sought to repair their relations with everybody, but there is tremendous mistrust of the Turks around the region. So it could only go so far. And they have asserted themselves in this whole Qatar imbroglio. Again, from their perspective, it's principled. Uh, and it's a way of shoring up a domestic base and domestic support that has noticeably softened. If you look at the referendum that was held in April about the new Turkish presidency that greatly enhances the power of the Turkish presidency, undermines checks and balances in the system, he barely won that. And they had to resort to some, let me put it this way, extraordinary measures to win by a very slim margin. So getting involved in the region, the, I, and, and the countries are playing their part. You know, we're welcoming our Ottoman brothers back to the region. It helps him domestically. And that's what I mean by when he wins, he wins. But when he loses, he also wins. A friend of both of us, the Egyptian-American uh, intellectual, Meghad Atiyah, uh, just wrote today on Twitter, uh, commenting on our discussion that we were about to have, saying, though pundits focus on politics, it is culture and history that are key to understanding Egypt's current predicament. Now, history is covered um, well in full stone. Culture is a more complicated issue. You touch upon the debate about the role of culture in um, their predicament, if we can use the term, between those that view that um, it has nothing to do with it, um, that it's a racist thing to discuss the role of culture, and between those that take it to a much uh, deterministic form of people are destined to this because of Arab culture. Where do you see the role of culture in the uprising or in the Arab world in general? Yeah, it's, it's, it's a great question. And let me just say as an aside, there has not been a book talk or interview that I have had since False Dawn was published in, in, on the 1st of June where I haven't gotten a question about culture. And, and, and Megid was at one of those events in New York where yeah. in seven questions that I was asked, six of them were about culture. And, and the event was over. I don't know how many people said, well, I guess your next book's going to have to be about culture in the, in the Middle East. And, it, it, I, and I think he's, you know, he's an he's a Egypt Yoda. I think he's quite right that history and culture are incredibly important. And I'm a political scientist by training, but I tell everybody, especially young people, come to me and say that they want to get their PhDs. And I, I always tell them that if I were to do it over again, I would probably do it in history. As much as I think political science is important, I think my interests have led me to read more and more about history than read works of, of social science. Culture, I'll say this, and, and you could tell from the, I walked right up to the culture argument and got frightened and walked right, right back. Because this is, a third, this is a third rail, and this is courting a tremendous amount of controversy. And I think, though, that in thinking about it, and, and there was this, you mentioned my blog, there's this little blog post that I did not long after I finished the draft because I was thinking about these issues in which, I, again, I walked up to the issue, and then I got a little afraid of it. But I, thinking about the, the culture that authoritarians themselves create, it, maybe this isn't about Arabs and maybe it's not about Muslims, but that authoritarian legacies create a certain, uh, authoritarian systems themselves create a certain culture 
Um, I don't want to say that Arabs and Muslims can't be Democrat because of culture, because they're Arabs or because they're Muslims. That's patently ridiculous. Um, and of course, when I talk about false dawn, I, this book is not about you can never have democracy in the, in the Muslim world or the Arab world. Just that this moment, it didn't work. It doesn't mean that it might not work in the future, but why didn't it work now when everybody thought this was 1989 or whatever analogy you wanted to use? I do think, though, that social scientists, particularly in the United States, particularly those trained in the last 35 years, have been unwilling to grapple with this idea of culture. And I think it's important for us to bring it back into the conversation. I don't know how to do that. I think I may try to write something big uh, on, this, on this issue, because I think we do suffer. Uh, we do suffer from my, my dream would be to write a book that Islamophobes hate, but that those who say culture has nothing to do with it also hate. So want everyone to hate it, basically. Well, I think so a lot of people hate it. I think a lot of people, yeah, exactly. That's, no, I mean, it get a dog like, if you want friends and wife. I remember, uh, <laughs> I remember the, the Obama administration's thinking, um, the revolutions, OK, the uprisings are happening. Um, Obama and the administration are thinking in terms of a democratic transition. And there's this story in the New York Times back in May 2011 Obama asks the staff to look at democratic transitions throughout history and to come back and tell him where Egypt would be, basically. And they return and they tell him Egypt is going to be either Chile or the Philippines or uh, South Korea was the third. And it was a striking experiment. I mean, A, the basic assumption that this is a democratic transition and nothing else, but then the, the choice of countries reflect this attitude of cultural doesn't matter because none of these countries shares anything with Egypt. Uh, it's an attitude that tells us religion doesn't matter, religious-based politics. I mean, what's the equivalent in Chile of the Muslim Brotherhood, right, for right. example? That's the kind of mindset that views culture as non-existent. Well, it, it is that kind of ahistoric... It, it, I remember that very well. And I remember it also in the, you know, Turkish model mania that I, I said, Egypt is going to be Egypt. It's not going to be, it's not going to look like something, you know, we want models. These are extraordinarily complex events. And why, why, do, we, why do we have models? They're a simplification of reality because the human mind can't take into consideration all of the factors that are going on and all the complicating factors. So we build models. I mean, you take a look at economist models. They're a representation, but they're not reality. That gives you insight. I think in this particular case, it couldn't possibly give you insight precisely because of history and culture. I mean, how, and, and, and this was the problem with that experiment, is exactly what you put on. It was what Obama was saying, what are the factors that led to transitions around the world and then let's look into Egypt and see where those factors are present. Ipso facto, we can then predict where Egypt is going to be. That's kind of the perfect thing that, that's, that's like a perfect dissertation. But it doesn't necessarily reflect how the world is actually, work, how the world actually works. And how it obviously worked in this instance. Because guess what? Egypt doesn't look like the Philippines. It doesn't look like Chile. What was the third one? South Korea. South Korea. It definitely yeah. doesn't look like South Korea. It looks like Egypt yeah. or some version of Egypt. Continuing on this line on Egypt, you describe Mubarak as he was steady, unimaginative, and durable. Fuad Ajami had famously, in a foreign affairs piece in 95, described him as a civil servant with the rank of president, <laughs> a man without any uh, dreams larger than his daily uh, life, basically. Sisi's different, isn't he? I mean, that's a guy that doesn't strike me, at least, as someone who you could describe as a civil servant with the rank of president. How would you describe Sisi? Well, first of all, now you know why I'm a Mubarakist. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I, 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 there, there is something in the last turbulent 
six and a half years that, that makes me long for, you know, the unimaginative, yeah. steady, durable Hosni Mubarak. Um, and I do think that in retrospect, um, there are certain things about H Mubarak's rule that Sisi could probably learn from. Um, that the Muslim Brotherhood is really a problem to be managed, not a problem that can be resolved. I don't think, maybe I'm wrong, and you certainly know more about this than I do, but it strikes me that you cannot radically reconstruct Egyptian nationalism and write the Muslim Brotherhood completely out of the history of Egypt. That it's some alien thing that came from Doha or Istanbul or somewhere else. We invented the thing. Yes, exactly. And that the Brotherhood, for better or worse, was critical to the crystallization of Egyptian identity in the, 20th, in the 20th century. So I think Mubarak, whether by accident or by insight, understood he cannot root these people out. This is the kind of, and this is the kind of thing that I wrote about in Ruling But Not Governing, that there was this, you know, the Brotherhood would be permitted to do certain things, and then it would accumulate, it would get a little too big for its britches, and it would, you know, cross, you can't say it in this town anymore, but cross a red line, and it would get repressed. Um, Sisi, obviously, very different yeah. from that. Although he may come to learn that he can't do that. Uh, how would I describe Sisi? In ways, he's revolutionary, um, in that he wants to radically reconstruct Egyptian nationalism. In ways, I find him hopelessly naive about Egyptian politics. In ways, I, find, I would describe him as incomplete in that I don't believe he's consolidated his power yet. Um, he doesn't command the state. There are sources of and places where there is, I think, considerable opposition to him in, in the state. And that's where I think politics actually happens in Egypt now. It's not, it's not in, in a reservoir of people coming into the streets and demanding change. It's among power centers. Um, but there is a whiff of familiarity to Egypt, I mean, a military officer, uh, a, 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 a repressive in political environment. Um, in ways, he's taking the steps that they, he w had wished or that, the, that rank of officer corps and watching what had happened in the late Mubarak period that they wished that Mubarak had taken. I think for Sisi and others, the late Mubarak period was a a distortion of the natural order of things. Um, because he was getting old and out of it, and he was giving too much room for Gamal and his political business pals. But I don't think he is, he's been, there's too much of CC is evil and so and so and so. He faces a certain set of incentives and constraints that forces him to do the things that he does. And he calculates his interests based on those constraints and those incentives. We don't know all of them because we don't know what goes on behind closed doors there. Um, I certainly don't think he's a good guy. <laughs> you know, like, <laughs> there are some leaders you look at and you say, wow, that's truly inspirational. Neither Mubarak nor Sisi are, are truly inspirational leaders. Um, but I think we have a tendency to view leaders, of, particularly in, the part in, in, in this part of the world, in a kind of personalized way, rather than understanding the institute, like I said, the institutional constraints. And it's the same thing with Erdogan. Erdogan is, you know, you know, painted as this kind of evil genius. You know, I mean, I just did it myself. He win when he wins, he wins, and when he loses, he loses. But he also uh, has a similar set. He has politics, in other words. We're nearly out of time for the questions, but let me throw in quickly uh, a question here. You argue in the book that uh, pretty much, or we can look at the region and say that nothing has changed. I mean, there's a continuity, continuity of politics, of institutions, of questions of identity, a continuity, a return of the same names, even in faces, Bejika, Sipsi, Haftar. What has changed in the Middle East? Because the people of the region, uh, despite getting back these authoritarians or otherwise, they've lived through a traumatic experience. I mean, imagine yourself having a house in Tahrir Square, overlooking the square every day, 
nearly, there's tear gas, there's a battle, there are people dying. What is the impact of all of this? And how has it changed the Middle East? Or has it not? Right. Has it not? And I think it, it's interesting. I, and I will, I will admit that you, despite my often sunny disposition, I'm terminally cynical and pessimistic about, about everything. And, and, but it, although it was actually hard to write a book, even, even with that, it was very hard to write a book about. But I th see it as a very kind of human, human story. I don't know if I lived above Tahrir Square, it would definitely be interesting to talk to people. I, I would actually support Sisi. Definitely. <laughs> um, I would want a return to some sense of, of normalcy. And that's the thing I think we miss, is that there is a, there is, we had assumed because there was an uprising that people wanted something different. And maybe they thought they did, or maybe a small subset wanted they did, but in the end, maybe they did. It turns out that they didn't. They're satisfied with something different. I, that's, that's a hard thing to, to come to terms with. I mean, you know the common phrase now in Egypt, at least we're not Iraq and Syria. Right. Exactly. Now, maybe that's a function of, maybe that's just a function of, of these upheavals. Um, but I do think that we miss a part of the story. And, you know, in the prologue, it's my notes from the night of the 25th and the early morning of the 26th. And I come upon, but in the prologue is basically my first person stream of consciousness account of trying to get into Tahrir Square on the night of January 25th, 2011. Um, by the time I arrived, I had, been, I had been with a small delegation of, you know, Council on Foreign Relations members, and we had been all over the city. And our last meeting of the day was at American University in Cairo. For any of you who know Cairo, know Egypt, it's like an hour and a half without traffic away. So by the time I arrived, it was, you know, 6.30, 7 o'clock in the evening, and the police had established this cordon around Tahrir Square. And I was trying desperately. I wanted to get into this square. I wanted to get into the square. And I tried every which way, and I found myself going down one street. And this, don't, don't take this wrong, you know, oh, he's an orientalist, whatever. Um, I find this, I come across this Macwaggy, an, 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 a launderer, and he's ironing. And he's within earshot of these massive protests. And he's just, he's just working away. And months later, I was talking to an, an, another Egyptian who was just frustrated by all of a sudden. He said, after all, this is just a fight amongst elites. Now, don't get me wrong. This is not an argument that people have, been made, that people have made over and over again that, oh, the Egyptian just wants there to be stability. Oh, you know, they're, they're, because of the rhythms of the Nile, they just, they're conditioned to, be, to want stability. No, I think that there's a sense of the turbulence, the promise of... Tahrir Square quickly became a battle over na narrow interests among elites and the rest of Egyptians who were like hoping to be delivered from their situation by these elites just said these are just cr as craven people as, as everyone else. Now that's kind of a personal perspective. Why I think that there's continuity is you see the institutional architecture of these countries, and they don't look all that different from when they did on in early December 2010. One thing that I do think ha I do think has changed is that there has been a mobilization of publics, or parts of publics, and that no, not Sisi, not Erdogan, not perhaps Khalifa Heftar, certainly not Asepsi. By the way, Asepsi to me is extraordinarily interesting. I mean, this is the youth revolution, and they elected an 88-year-old dude who's now like 91 years old, and this is the president of Tunisia. And he's like the symbol of the democratic change in, in the region. Just an irony. Anyway, so it, that none of them have articulated a vision for the future that truly captures the imagination of people. So everything ends up being contested. So yes, it's authoritarian, but it's also unstable. It's contested, it's unstable, it's sometimes horrifically violent. And that's where I think these leaders have 
fallen down and where there's a change. I think that there's a hunger for it. I think Mubarak's coda of you know, stability for the sake of development won't work again. Um, and I think if, there's a, if there is some hope in this story, it's that there has to be something. People are still wanting, wanting change. It's not, it, it, it's not, it's continuity because politics and history has conspired against what people wanted, is what, maybe that's the best way to answer it. Well, with that, let's uh, open the floor for questions by the audience. Please, uh, when you get the mic, uh, identify yourself and ask your question. Yeah. Lauren Thompson. Um, um, if Israel had been established in Argentina, and if massive oil reserves had only been discovered in Siberia, what would be the relevance, the significance, the importance of the middle, modern Middle East? Well, um, I, I, it's a great question because when you think about American interests in the Middle East at a kind of basic level, there's three. Uh, ensuring the free flow of energy resources out of the region, helping to ensure Israeli security, and making sure that the United States remains the dominant power in the region, which is, of course, derivative of the first two interests. Now, you can add counterterrorism and counterproliferation, but again, those are also, seems to me, those are all connected to these, these, these other things. And I, I had a colleague who I, and I thought it was a terrific book um, about Saudi Arabia. And the, the argument was that there's more to the U.S.-Saudi relationship than just oil. And I, I thought it was a, a great diplomatic history of the U.S.-Saudi relationship. But when I was reading it in draft form, I said, Let me, let's play a thought experiment. Let's assume that Saudi Arabia doesn't have oil. Why are we interested in, in Saudi Arabia? Because there's pearls in the Persian Gulf? I, you know, I, um, I, think it's a, I think it's a fair question. All that being said, we can replay history in a variety of ways. Saudi Arabia, the Gulf, is an enormous source of energy in the world. Even if the United States is, becomes energy independent, we're going to be interested in ensuring the free flow of oil out of the region because we have an interest in a functioning global capitalist economic order and our major trading partners are dependent upon that oil. 60% uh, of India's energy resources come from the Persian Gulf. We want India to be successful. We want China to be successful. We want Japan. We want South Korea to be successful. Israel would not have worked anywhere other than where it was. End of story. <laughs> yes, back in the end. Thank you, Professor. I'm wondering, what is, the, what is the role of Sharia in the Middle East, and how does it reflect upon Arab Americans? Well, that's not the subject of, of the book, but I will say that there, is a, there are robust debates uh, in the region, and this is precisely what I was talking about in my answer to the last question, is these debates about what are the, what's the positive vision for the future that's going to capture the minds of most people? And that was the problem with the Muslim Brotherhood in Egypt. In that, you know, we thought at the time, given the fact that the Brotherhood had been around for 80 years and under, you know, successive uh, leaders, it had become perhaps the most prestigious and influential opposition group in Egypt, that when finally the Brotherhood had a plurality of the seats in the Egyptian parliament and the Egyptian presidency, that their kind of moralizing, religious, yet authoritarian vision for the future was something that would capture the minds of Egyptians and they would be successful. Actually, that wasn't true. That wasn't true. People rejected that. Uh, he got, I mean, Mohamed Morsi, the, the president of Egypt, got a lot of help in failing. But he would not have failed so spectacularly had more people bought what the Brotherhood was selling. What the effect, how people view Sharia in the United States, I think is as rich 
uh, as there are different opinions within the Arab American community, not all of whom are, are Muslims. And to be honest with you, I know a lot more about politics in the Middle East than I do about debates that go on within the, the Arab American community here. Thank you. Uh, I have a question to you uh, related to uh, uh, an idea that you wrote here in the first of the book, which is when, when you says that... In the book flap? Yeah, yeah. Uh, you, you, you said that uh, there was no revolution, and also you said this in, uh, in, in your speech today. Uh, why, how, how you see what happened, I mean, how you see this as not, as not revolution? I mean, for me, I was in Egypt, like, for the whole 18 days, I was, like, five minutes away from Tahrir Square, and I saw everything, and it was, for me, it is a revolution, and this is, it starts with the kind of um, unrealistic hope, um, and and then it, it's this everywhere, it's it's the revolution everywhere, it's the idea, it's the idea itself of, of burning everything, and then it ends up as, this this what happened in history, that what happened in France, that what happened in in, in, in Russia, that what happened in, in, in China, this, this, in, in North Korea, it's, it's the idea of the revolution. This is like you, you just want to do the idea that, that you will create the heaven on earth. But in fact, this is, this is, this is the idea. I mean, how, how, how you saw the first five days as, as something I was there. I, I, did, I didn't see it as you saw it. I, 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 saw, I, I saw it as something as, as evil from the beginning. I, as evil from the yeah. beginning. Yeah. I, 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 I never felt that, that people are there are accepting other people and accepting other ideas. Um, I saw the idea of rejecting every, every modern ideas in, in the world that was mostly Islamist or, or socialists. There, there was nothing else. And, and the idea of like uh, uh, you you said in, in December when you when you saw the protest in front of the uh, the assembly, uh, uh, people were saying this to the marshal and and I think this was the idea at the beginning as well. There was like this famous um, I don't know how to call this in English, but things like that. The hang up like Mubarak, 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 yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. It, it was it was as this. <sighs> Why, why, why you're just making a distinction between uh, the idea of revolution and you see it as a, as a good thing, while it's not? Let me uh, erase a, a number of interesting points, and let me get at this question of revolution first, and then I'll respond to the other part of your question. In my reevaluation of what happened and the way in which observers, both within the Middle East and those here in Washington and other places, talked about revolutions in Egypt or Tunisia or Libya didn't sound right to me, based on what I know about revolutions. And I, people started using it as an offhand. There was a revolution. Mubarak fell. Oh, it was a revolution. But if you read literature about revolutions, and there's a vast revolution of it, and people try to figure out how you predict revolutions and evaluations of the French Revolution, so on and so forth. In my wanting to understand better what happened in the Middle East, I turned to a, a scholar named Theta Scotchpole, who had written a famous book, States and Social Revolutions. And her definition is a demanding definition of revolution. It's not just the people rose up and a leader was deposed. It's that you have to have the overthrow of both the political institutions of the state. And when I talk about the political institutions of the state, I'm talking about the, the rules, the laws, the regulations, the decrees, the legislation that are the frameworks of these political systems. And at the same time, you have to have the overthrow of the predominant, the dominant social order, because these things are mutually reinforcing. The institutions reflect the interests of the people in power. If you think about her definition, it opens up interesting avenues of analysis and interpretation about what actually happened in the Middle East. So the people rose up and Mubarak fell. But the political institutions, the system didn't fall, and the social institutions, the, the social makeup of 
the ruling class and their relationship with other classes remained exactly as it was. And it suggested to me that there wasn't, hold on one second, I knew everybody going to know. It suggested to me that actually what we were looking at was an uprising and a leadership change, not actually a revolution. Now, in terms of what you saw in Tahrir Square versus what I saw in Tahrir Square, Maybe it's a function of the fact that you're Egyptian and I'm just an observer. And there's only, despite years of studying Arabic and visiting Egypt and so on and so forth, there's only so much that I can know that, and that I, I can't understand fully. But what I experienced in that, and admittedly not there the whole time, was unity, uh, expressions of desire for a better, a better future. Um, Maybe part of the reason, and this is not something that I address in the book so directly, maybe part of the problem was the people who actually made this uprising uh, were bad at politics or were not good people, as you suggest. Um, but to me, the real explanation for why, or a better explanation, I'm going to say the real explanation, a better explanation for why Egypt ended up the way it did was that it didn't have a revolution. It had an uprising and a leadership change, a personnel change to be perfectly snarky about the whole thing. Um, but that Mushir Tantawi, Field Marshal Tantawi, how different was he from Hosni Mubarak? And you did have the interregnum of Mohammed Morsi and the Muslim Brotherhood, but it didn't last very long because you had a restoration. He was never able to rule. He was never able to govern. And then you re very quickly had a restoration of the normal course of things in Egypt. Would the American or the glorious revolution fit in that definition? The American Revolution. And the glorious revolution yeah. of the UK. Yes. The American Revolution. Yeah. Social structures in the South. Well. Uh, I mean, the glorious revolution, revolution is obviously much more clear as an example right. of less the dramatic change that the definition would right. require. Right to be defined as a revolution. And of course, are there failed revolutions? 1905, Russia. Right. right. I think that's right. Is the Arab Spring a failed revolution or not a revolution in the first place? I think that's uh, I think it's a. I think it's not a revolution in the first place. I think a failed revolution, I wish Scott, I wish Scotch Bowl was here, uh, would be one where you did have the overthrow of both political institutions in the social order, but you had something very, it, 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 it did not, and it, it, it did not result in a fundamental change um, in, uh, in, in the political system, um, that there was quickly a counter-revolution. Uh, but again, we can, we can tease all of this out, I think, for, forever, with different interpretations of revolution, but I think the point that I try to make, and I think I was clear in my discussion about revolution, is that, of course, revolutions are not a prerequisite for democracy. You've had revolutions and you have, you know, fiercer, for lack of better terms, authoritarianism result. But what was important to me was what was left behind when these leaders were deposed. And what was left behind when they were deposed had a profound effect on their trajectory afterwards. And what was left behind in Egypt's case in particular was a political political order and social order that remain largely intact. Even in Libya, you had things that were continuous. Yeah. Unfortunately, we're out of time for questions. But the good news is that uh, after the, we finish here, the reception will be again open. And Stephen will be kindly here to sign copies of the book for those who want to. Before and I go. To answer any questions that you can very shortly tell him? It would be my great pleasure, keeping in mind that I have to run back and edit an article on Turkey. But uh, <laughs> it would be my great pleasure to, to chat. Thank you, everyone. Thank you all very much for coming. Thank you.